Hello and welcome to Foster Care, an Unparalleled Journey. This is Jason Palmer. Amanda, my wife, and I have been doing this uh, podcast for a while, and we have decided to try and alongside of our podcast and our Facebook page, we've decided to start putting some, uh, some of our work up on YouTube as well. So we recorded a YouTube live video tonight. And we are going to begin kind of releasing those maybe midweek. I don't know exactly how we're going to do that, but they'll show up and be in the, the feed here and there. Hopefully you guys like them. Leave me some feedback if you would, and let me know. And feel free to go leave us a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify, Google Play, wherever you get your podcast. And here we go. I hope you enjoy it. This is Foster Care, an Unparalleled Journey with Jason. And Amanda. And this is our first time going live on pretty much any platform, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so we don't really know what we're doing yet. So if we look like we're stumbling through, have patience and a little bit of mercy. We don't really know what we're doing. Uh, we have a uh, podcast called Foster Care, an Unparalleled Journey. You can pick that up on iTunes or Spotify or Google Play, it's on all the regular things and then a whole bunch of unregular things. So you can look around and find it if you're interested in listening to it. But tonight we just wanted to come in and talk about a topic here. I was, uh, I got a post from Amanda she sent me, she found on Facebook today. And it was a uh, blog post from February of 2016. The name of the blog was I Must Be Trippin' on Blogspot. Uh, but it was a post about a bunch of different things about foster care and since we are a foster and adoptive family we have a decent amount of experience there i was reading through it and one of the posts kind of struck me and i'm going to read part of the post here it was uh things that you need to know if you're thinking about becoming a foster parent and one of them was know your limits the post goes like this when you step into a world of foster or adoption land one of the very first questions they ask you is what age, gender, race, behaviors, medical needs, number of children, etc. do you feel you are willing and able to accept? I have learned over the years that there is definitely a reason for that. Foster parents' heart are often more I'm sorry, are often much larger than our brains, and the thought of saying no to any child seems inconceivable. This is where you have to be honest with yourself and know what you can handle and not handle. Not just you as a parent, but your entire family. It is much better to set limits when it comes to accepting placements than to get in over your head and potentially have to disrupt a placement later. You will find that your abilities and family will grow and adjust with time as well, and it is perfectly acceptable to reevaluate as time goes on. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, I, I'm going to say, you know, that that's some place where we had to learn. We had to decide what was right for, for us and our, our kids you know, our family and, and what worked and what didn't work. Absolutely. Yeah, we did. You know, some of it was trial and error, you know. Sometimes uh, more error <laughs> than... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, there were some errors, but we made it through. You know, I would say one thing that was, you know, from the beginning, one thing that was important to us is we always kind of wanted to try to keep our birth order in place for our children. Yeah. Um, That didn't always didn't always work out. Because you don't always just get one kid. Sometimes <laughs> you get two or three kids. And so you can't always preserve that. But that was one thing that we always tried to do for our biological kids and the children that we had adopted in our home. Yeah. We wanted them to keep their spot. You know, they everybody had their role and their spot. And we didn't want to take that away and give it to another kid. We didn't want there to be resentment. Well, I mean, in all honesty, there's no way to not change the birth order to some degree. But we always chose just to keep it uh, the same age or younger than our youngest kid at the time, whatever the, that age was. And that gave us the ability to be able to uh, to kind of leave the structure in place to some degree. So, that, And that always seemed to work out well for us. You know, and um, I know that a lot of people kind of, kind of bristle a little bit at hearing the... Uh, you know, the fact that you can choose not just age, but gender and race and behaviors and medical needs and all that sort of thing. But even things like race are important to pay attention to because 
if you have a family member who has a lot of problems with a certain race of people and you're going to be closely connected with them, bringing them into that could be a real danger. Well, yeah, I mean, it leads, it leads to a lot of potential to do more harm than good. You know, you have the potential to harm a child instead of help a child. You know, and I would say it also depends on where you live, too. Yeah. You know, there's some places where, you know, it's just not accepted. You know, we still, you know, we're still in that day and age where not everything is accepted. Yeah, I would agree there. I mean, and we're, well, if you don't know us, which on here I can't don't know why you would because we're brand new to YouTube, <laughs> but we are in the kind of east central Missouri area. We are west of St. Louis by a good clip, but we're, we're kind of in the, starting into the rural area of Missouri here. And in our specific little town, we have a pretty integrated, you know, culture. There's a lot of white kids, a lot of black kids, a lot of mixed kids. Uh, a lot of kids, I couldn't tell you what race they are exactly. And it seems to be that in our little area, it's not much of a deal. But you don't have to go too far to find somebody who could have a problem with it. And even outside of that, we had some family members that we wouldn't talk to before we started doing it. And just said, hey, just so you know, this is what we're looking at doing. And if you have a problem with that, let us know now because we just won't be around. And uh, and that ended up working out pretty well for us because even the family members we thought we would have problems out of, we didn't have any problems out of them. Yeah, I mean, the one particular family member, we actually, you know, she had a change of heart. You know, it really opened up her eyes and and opened up her heart, too. There was a lot of growth growth there where I saw potential, you know, for it to be a disaster. Yeah, But, you know, it, it, it really changed her heart, and it was really wonderful to see. But that was something that we had to think about saying no about just because we had to know it was best for the kids. And, uh, you know, so I'm glad that on that one we, we went that way. But there were a couple times when we ended up having to say no to something that really just wasn't the best thing for us. Yeah, I mean, teens was always kind of something that we were we always kind of shied away from. Yes. You know, we, we knew that. Or at least we thought we knew that, you know, toddlers and babies, you know, that was going to be our thing. We were we were good at that. We had we had mastered that. We had had many of them. We hadn't had many teens. Yeah. Um, you know, so teens were scary. They're still scary. <laughs> we got a couple of teens that, yeah, they're scary. Um, you know, but teens was the other, you know, the other part that we decided, you know, that might not be for us. Um, but we did end up taking a teen. Yeah, we got a phone call <laughs> and uh, had a young guy who who was going to end up going to uh, Boys Town, which I don't know if Boys Town is a thing everywhere. But, you know, it's it's kind of, um, it's not juvenile. It's like a group home for boys, I guess well, you would say. Well, it, it is like a, ju a, juvenile, a juvie group home for boys. But let me back up just a second. Um with that particular placement, it, it started, you know, we just need a home for the weekend. Yeah. So that we can we can get get this young man set up where he needed to be. You know, emergency placement for the weekend, which is why, you know, against our better judgment, we said, you know, it's a weekend. We can do a weekend. You know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We can do this. We got this. And we did it a weekend. You know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We did it next Monday weekend. came and I heard nothing. So Tuesday morning, I'm calling our worker and she says, well, here's the thing. We can't find a place for this young man. Yep. We have no family members. We have no homes. We've exhausted all of our resources. He's been in several other homes and none of his placements have ever stuck. You know, I can come and get him today. And I said, well, what happens if you come and get him today? And she said, well, I'll be honest with you. If I come and pick this young man up today, I'm going to take him to Boys Town. And Boys Town is kind of like a juvie. Um, you know, there's kids that have gotten into trouble, runaways, theft, drugs. Um, and it just, it, it broke my heart that there was this young man that, you know, he wasn't a thief. He wasn't a drug addict. He was... 18 that needed help he was a victim of the circumstances of his parents you know and so it just it, it it broke my heart and you know so me and jason we talked about it um because you have to talk to your other half that's key 
please talk to your other half. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but we talked about it and, you know, we decided, okay, maybe we can do this, you know, because the alternative didn't seem like a good plan for this young man. Yeah. You know, and so we tried. We tried. Um, and it didn't go as planned. It never does. Um, but we did our best, you know, and and unfortunately, you know, we did have to disrupt this placement. Yeah. You know, this young man, he needed more. He needed more than what we could give him. With all the younger kids in the house, we did not have the time or the resources to get him the help that he needed where we were at. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. And, and, you know, when he left, it was, I talked with the worker the next day and he was with us for about five weeks. And I, I called him the day, the next day and said, Hey, I'm sorry that went down the way it did. But, you know, he was, um, he was trying to kind of buck up to Amanda a little bit and trying to almost act like he was going to be a little bit physical and, and whether that was his intention to come across that way or not, I don't really know, but that's how he came across. And the reason why he had to leave is because my other two teen boys at that point looked at at mom and said, Mom, do you want us to take care of this? We'll take it. And they kind of got aggressive, and it looked like we were about to end up with in some sort of physical violence. And we said, yeah, no, we don't need this problem. And none of that happened. There was no physical violence. No. You know, but there there were some issues and there was a little bit of an unhealthy attachment. Yeah. You know, it, it was best for that young man and for our family for us to say, okay, this isn't working anymore. Yeah. You know, so you can say no. You know, you do get that choice. But to know your limits ahead of time and to be willing to stick with that. Because what happened was is we may have been that young man's longest placement, but we were also a disruption. Yeah. We were one more place where it didn't work. But uh, I guess the good side is he did not end up going to Boys Town. He stayed with us for about five weeks, and the worker told me that was the longest placement he'd ever been able to stay at. So I felt good that at least we'd stuck it out pretty long, You know, gave him the, the best chance we could give him. But he did eventually end up going to a... Uh, to a family type placement. I forget exactly how he was related. It was an uncle or brother-in-law or somebody. I, I don't know. Yeah. But he, he ended up going to a family placement. But the other part of that story is, is we still see this young man from time to time. You know, we see him out in public. We've seen him at church and he's been able to approach us and we say, hi, how are you doing? You know, how's life going? You know, we've been able to see him from time to time watch him grow and he seems to be doing really well yep. and i don't think that he would have thrived like that in our house yeah i i agree i agree there was there was only one of the placement we ever had to really drop a hard no on and we had a pair of young boys these guys were probably two three four years old in that range and um you know, they came to our house and they stayed with us for a while. I forget exactly how long they were with us the first time. But they came to us and they, it was, again, I think it was another, like, emergency placement sort of a thing. They were supposed to have their forever home coming up. and But the, the adoptive parent had to get a few things taken care of, if I remember right. And they were just going to be with us for a short time. And so they stayed with us. And the, the one little boy, he was never diagnosed. And I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist, although I play one on YouTube. I was going to say, you tell me you are all the time. No, I say I'm a completely untrained, <laughs> practicing, hobbyist psychologist. But uh, I'm not a real psychologist. I just play one on YouTube. But if I had to guess, I would say that, that if he would have been to, if he would have been into a, um, into be uh, checked out, he, he would have probably been diagnosed ODD. He was uh, oppositional defiance disorder was what I saw in him for what that's worth. You know, if if you said yes, he said no before the why was done. And I don't do well with that. I'm, I'm, that's not my strong point. I, 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 I do well with kids that I can work with and, you know, become, kind of partner with. But when everything you do is met with a fight, it just... Well, and this has been several years back and a few teenagers ago, so mm -hmm. I, I've learned how to... <laughs> 
I've learned how to work with that and become a lot better with that now. But at the time, it was just, it was a struggle. It was a real struggle for, for us. In your older age, you have found a lot more patience. I have found more patience <laughs> as I... The patience comes as the, as the, along with the gray, so you know. Is that what it is? I guess, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no. So they they left and, and went to their 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 forever home, or at least that was a plan, and it did not last long at all. And I forget why that particular um, placement disrupted. I just know that it did. And we were out at the uh, there's a local flea market. It's actually a pretty good sized flea market. They have a lot of a lot of vendors show up there, and they do it weekly and. We were out there that morning, and uh, just us and our kids at the time. We didn't have any foster kids with us. And we were just out kind of just... Spending the day. Yeah. Yeah, it was a nice day. And um, it was an outdoor market sort of thing. We just went out and hung out. And my phone rings, and it's a children's division marker calling us to say, Hey, these kids are coming back in. We need a placement. I know you were the last placement. Do well, and they had been again? gone long. They had maybe been gone a week and a half. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It was a, little, yeah, it, it a, week was a very two. short time. Um, the the woman who had taken these two young boys, she just wasn't set up to be able to handle, you know, not being listened to and two young boys when she didn't have young kids before. You know, it was a valiant effort. Yeah, we'll um, give her that. She, but she was not not ready for. For the trials that she was going to face, and the one brother, he was he was a really happy, really compliant, really just kid who seemed comfortable in his own skin. He was a little bit younger, and the older brother was the one who was really defiant. And you know, I I've learned since that that usually means that that's just signs of their trauma. There was some sort of trauma going on there that that we didn't know how to deal with at the time. But when they called us back. Um, Amanda had taken one of the younger kids over to the bathroom and I got the phone call and I thought for a moment and you know all those things that you hear about always say no if you if you feel it's the right thing you know don't push and I sat and I felt a little bit guilty to be perfectly honest to say ah, you know that wasn't the best fit for our home well and we asked our children too I didn't not, I did. not when they first called there I didn't well I ended up asking our children because for me to say no goes against everything in me. I I, I have a real hard time with that. <laughs> Which is why I and, did not uh, <laughs> ask you. I was on the phone with the children's division worker while you were walked away. And what I told the worker was, um, why don't you call around? It wasn't the best fit for our home. Call around, see if you can find another placement. And if you can't, call us back. But I, I wanted to to kind of give us a little bit of an out first to see if if we could find a better plan for him. And when she came back up and I told her what had happened, and the first thing she did was mention a couple, uh, a couple other foster parents that we know who had, they had some daughters, and they wanted to be able to, to uh, adopt little boys. They wanted a, a little boy or two. And that was just what they wanted and, and to, to kind of round out their family. And, and that's, she mentioned them. I went, why did I ever think of that? <laughs> They're looking for boys. And, you know, those are boys that, that, you know, they were, if I remember right, they were already legally available for adoption. Yes, I, they were. Yeah. I don't know anything about their, about their foster case, you know, or their, their, their uh, bio parent case prior to that. I, I may have known some of the details, but I don't remember it now. Yeah, they were they were free and clear for adoption. Yeah. And but to know that she mentioned them, I called. I, we called the worker back and said, "Hey, have why, you called? Yeah, why don't you give these guys a call? Because this is what they are looking for." And I'll tell you what, it was not many months later when I happened to uh, see them. Talking about their their uh, and they they were talking about their pending adoption coming up, and those two boys ended up in in their home forever. And I mean, we're talking years ago, and these two young men are doing great. They they found their forever home, um, with a mom and a dad and sisters, and you know they're doing phenomenal. And had we have taken those two young men back, they might not have gone on to their forever their forever family. Yeah. You know, that opportunity may have been missed. And, and I, I want to tell you guys that story just so you know that, you know, if you're a foster family out there somewhere, you know, if 
if you're a, if you're a foster kid or were in the foster care system, and you got to understand that sometimes certain kids just don't mess with certain families, and it doesn't mean there's a problem with the kid necessarily. It means that we don't mess well. You know, there's a there's a whole lot of women in the world that did not get to date or marry me. I was the lucky one. <laughs> Yay me! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know that, but that's the thing is, you know, some some fits just aren't aren't good fits, and thank God we were willing to realize that and say no in that moment so that they could go on to find the place that was the best for them, and that that really, you know, I look back and go as much as we we felt bad in the moment, you know, we talked about it later, we felt bad in the moment, but it felt so good a year or two later to see them not oh, only absolutely. in another house but thriving in that home and and the other the other parents you know they were a little bit younger than us um you know that their their situation their background was different and they really thrived with dealing with these kids who you know especially the one the one boy who had so many defiance issues and you know they really seemed to be able to, to understand how to handle that they did a better job than i ever would have done well the thing was is i remember getting on facebook one day um and just brought a big smile to my face and actually tears to my eyes. I got to see all the adoption day photos of this family. Just so happy. And the smiles on these two little boys faces. And you know, it, it took away all those feelings of regret or, you know, feeling bad and guilt for, for saying no. Um, it just, it may, it felt right. It, it made it all come back around and say, I made the right decision. This yeah. is what was best for these kids. And it's what was best for our family at the time. Yeah. And the children that we had in our home. So when people tell you that if you feel like you need to say no, you should say no, believe it. Because, you know, we're not the only foster home out there. We are not the ones responsible for being the savior of every child in the world. We take care of what we can. We do what's good for best for our family and best for the kids we bring in. And that was a situation where we were at least wise enough to say, this is not the best for us or them. Look here, you know, go look there. And they ended up in the best possible situation. So yeah, that, that worked out really well for us. Yeah. I mean, it, it really did. It is, you know, it took me a while to, to really believe that it is okay to say no. It really is okay to say no, because in the end, you can end up doing more harm than good. And we're here to do good. We're here to do the best that we can with what we have. And I would never want to intentionally cause harm. And I could do that by taking a placement that was not oh, yeah. right for our home. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I can I can harm that child. I can harm our children. You know, and it, it took me a while to be okay with that. But seeing the times that we have said no, seeing the outcome, it was the right thing to do. And I would do it over again. I would, and the, I would say no again. And you have to be able to stand up for yourself and say no. Children's Division will call again. I promise you. <laughs> yeah, if you will. tell them no, they will call you again and again and again and again. Yes, they will. <laughs> uh, did you have anything else to say about this one today? or? Um, actually, I did. I do want to say, when you first become a foster parent and that phone rings, you get really excited. You're like, this is what I've been waiting for. This is all the long hours and the classes and the home studies and putting yourself out there. So you get that first phone call and and you're excited. Have yourself a list of questions together. Yeah. Get yourself a list of questions that you want to ask, the information that you need to be able to make an informed decision for yourself and your family. I will tell you, in, in the moment, they may not, the caseworkers are not going to have all of the answers, but they may have some clues. But have yourself a list of questions so you don't get caught up in the moment of just saying yes. Yeah. What are your non-negotiables? Have a list of things that you're not willing to put up with. You yeah, know. your deal breakers. I mean, for some people, that's, you know, it might be a kid who's who's experienced sexual abuse because that, that really wigs certain people out. They can't, you know, they don't want to think about that. Well, it does. And, it, and if it's something that is a trauma in your past that is going to make it difficult for you to be able to parent 
or help this child, you know, you need to know. Yeah, because the best thing you can do is know your own triggers so that you don't pass those on to another kid. So, so yeah, just know, know the things that you're looking for and be willing to ask about those. And, and remember that, yeah, you're right, Amanda, that's the workers tell you what they know, but sometimes there's, that's a real short list. I, I remember, I remember, well, when a couple kids who are still here showed up at our house 10 <laughs> years ago, I think it was, yeah, about 10 years ago. Maybe. We asked the question, are they potty trained? And the worker said, I don't know. Let's check and see if they're wearing diapers. Yeah, that's true. I remember that pretty clearly. <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, we had been out of diapers with our other kids for several years. I thought, oh, man, we didn't even think about this. Turned out they were potty trained. (laughs) Yay. But I think the only other thing that I really wanted to touch on is when when a child comes into care, there's always some sort of trauma. They wouldn't be here if there wasn't some sort of trauma. And so I just want to express that if you say yes when you know it's a bad fit, and you have to disrupt that placement, that's one more trauma for that child. That's one more broken attachment. And you may think, oh, I'm just foster mom and foster dad. You know, I, I'm just a caregiver. To these kids, that can be everything. They're here. They're, they want to trust you. And it takes a while to gain that trust, but they want that trust. They want that love, that foundation. And so you want to do everything in your power not to break that. It's been broken enough. So if it's something that you can't do, just man up and say, it's not for me. Yeah. Call and me on call me on the next go round. Yep. And they will. There will be another kid available. <laughs> Sometimes if... they'll call you more <laughs> for more than once in a day. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, that's that's exactly right. Because at the end of the day, we're not doing this to make ourselves more awesome. We're not doing this to increase the size of our family we're not doing this for any reason that has to do with us and if you're doing it for that reason you're doing it for all the wrong reasons you're doing it take care of your kid and you got to realize what's best for them and if you don't think that you are going to be able to handle this then you probably should pass and let someone else take care of it if that that does feel like they can handle it so that you don't end up disrupting a placement absolutely yeah. You know, and and that's why we're here to provide strength among the weakest. Yep. Yep. That's our mission statement. Yeah. Providing yeah. strength for the weakest among us. So, all right, well, we are a little bit over the time we had planned to be on here, so Peace we're, out. We're going to jump off of here and we will probably record another one soon. I don't know if we're going to do it tonight or not yet. It's getting kind of late here. Um, well, we are old. It's past our bedtime. Yeah, it was past my bedtime at <laughs> 7.30, you whippersnapper. Oh, well, you know, it happens. <laughs> but yeah, so we're, we're, we're going to put a few of these up here on the channel and see if anybody likes it. Uh, it's YouTube. You know the deal. Like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Check out our podcast. Yep, look at the podcast. Give us some feedback we want to hear. Yep. If there's something you want to know about, questions you have, leave it. We'll yep. touch on it. Foster care and unparalleled journey, which is kind of a difficult one to uh, spell out. It's one R, two L's, and then one L. Um, <laughs> or you just go on there and search for, uh, go into your podcast app and search for Jason and Amanda Palmer, and you'll find us there. So we'll see you guys soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.